Hey everyone, this is Pete. Welcome back to Atari 8 to Z, a series of short playthroughs of Atari 8-bit games, some of which I grew up with and some of which are new to me. Today is sort of somewhere in between, actually. This is Quasimodo uh, by Synapse Software, um, who we've come across a couple of times in this series already. So, for the unfamiliar, uh, Synapse Software was an American software company uh, that put out a whole bunch of games between about uh, 1981 and 1984, if I remember correctly. Um, a lot of their games get got brought to the UK by uh, an early incarnation of a publisher called US Gold, uh, who became particularly prominent uh, towards the end of the 8-bit era and into the 16-bit home computer era. So, one of their imprints uh, around sort of 1983 or so, which is when this came out, if I remember correctly, uh, was Synsoft, which brought a lot of uh, Synapse Software's games to the UK. Now, the reason I say this is somewhere in between um, a game that I played growing up and one that's new to me is that um, I originally had a copy of this on our old Atari home computers and it didn't work. It was one of numerous pirated games that my father and brother had acquired from the local computer club, as uh, was the the tradition in the day. Um, but the copy didn't work. But I was really curious to play it for some reason. Um, and so when the opportunity arose a little bit later, uh, this was still before I'd left time for, for university, I think, but a little bit later than when the Atari 8-bit was sort of our main computer, um, I, I picked up a boxed copy of the game that was not very expensive. Uh, and so I was finally able to play it for the first time. And it turns out it's quite good. So, let's take a look at it. So it came to pass long ago that three mysterious jewels with ancient powers of teleportation were found and secretly hidden by Quasimodo in his underground cave beneath a dark medieval castle, where Quasi hoped that the powerful jewels would be safe from the dark forces of evil. And so they were, until one day when they were stolen. So yeah, that's the concept of this game. Quasi has had his three jewels stolen, and you need to get them back. Now, one of the interesting things about this game, uh, I think, from a sort of historical perspective, is that around the era uh, that this was released, Quasimodo was a very popular character for some reason to adapt to video games. I'm not entirely sure why that was, because this was uh, this was long before Disney's adaptation of The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Um, but there were quite a few games involving Quasimodo. There was the arcade game Hunchback, uh, which this game is actually often erroneously described as a clone of, when in fact it's nothing like it. Um, and in fact, I believe the first ever game that I typed in out of a magazine um, was in Atari User. It was one of their five-liner games, so it was written in just five lines of basic. And it was basically a text mode adaptation of this first stage that you're seeing here. So, with Quasimodo standing on top of the... Um, of the battlements, throwing rocks down at enemies who are slowly coming up the screen. Now, this idea was adapted in quite a few sort of Quasimodo or Quasimodo-inspired games over the years. There were also a few that didn't directly involve the Hunchback character as well. I believe Orc Attack was one uh, that was very much like this, but yeah, this was quite a, a, quite a popular concept. Um, but where this game differs from one, that original Five Liners thing that I typed in, uh, and also things like Hunchback and Orc Attack and such like, is that it's got more to it. So, you've got three jewels to acquire, and you have to get them in different ways. So the first one you get, it's just at the top of that first ladder, so you just basically have to survive the, the rock throwing stage. And then after that you have to get through this platforming sequence here, which involves jumping on the bells and swing it from platform to platform and not falling off like I just did. So, the controls for this bit, you can sort of adjust how strong the swing is and you'll hear the bell will actually ring when it gets to its furthest possible extremity. And you have to time your jump so that Quasi has got some velocity going, but also where he's not going to fall too far and hurt himself or he's, where he's not going to overshoot a platform that sort of thing so it's actually pretty difficult 
And so in situations like this, you actually want to... Oh, no! Not do that. Yeah, in situations like that, you want to uh, actually maybe not let the bell reach its full extent of motion. And you've got those bloody bats in the way as well. Quite literally, bats in the belfry, as they say. Oh, this game is difficult. <laughs> Alright, let's have another go at that. So, yes, we know all this. Very good. Cutscene. Right, let's try again. So you probably noticed on the title screen there's uh, a little message at the side that says if Happy cannot copy it, Rob can. Um, that's a reference to the fact that this version that I'm playing here is a, a pirate copy. Um, as are most of the versions that you'll find distributed on the internet these days. Simply because pirated versions tend to have things like copy protection and stuff stripped out. And they're also often distributed um, in collections with other games. It's a bit more sort of efficient to get those games than the original single-use discs that they were um, they were distributed on. Not single-use, but like sing a single game or application on one disc. The one thing pirates got very good at in the 8 and 16-bit era of home computing was compression. And so you'll find on the Atari 8-bit, and the ST for that matter, um, you'll get basic floppy disks that are normally formatted for the platform but they've got way more stuff on them than should be able to fit so for example there's instances of like multi-disc games taking up just one disc um there's popular collections of games that are out there so there's um homesoft is the popular compilation of atari 8-bit archived pirate software uh, that you can still get out online these days and uh, I believe for the ST, it's Automation is one of the main um, sort of groups who did this sort of thing. And so if you're interested in getting into this side of things through emulation or whatever, then uh, yeah, Homesoft. No. Oh, OK. All right. We'll go this way then, shall we? Um, yeah, Homesoft and Automation are a good place to start looking. Um, but yeah, the, the actual message there, it says, if Happy cannot copy it, Rob can. That's a reference to a popular modification for the Atari 1050 disk drive, um, just called the Happy Modification. I'm not entirely sure offhand what it does, because uh, I've got an Atari 1050 disk drive that is unfortunately a bit poorly at the time of writing, but uh, time of writing, time of speaking, recording, whatever. Um, and so I've never actually had that mod applied to the disk drive but I, I believe it's something along the lines of it helps it load quicker or uh, access more compressed information or something like that um, and it was quite popularly used for duplicating disks and copying software and that kind of thing so <clears throat> that's what the the reference is to so if the a hap even a happy modified 1050 disk drive wasn't able to copy it then Rob was Good for Rob. Right, made it. Okay. So now we have to time it right to get between these bats. So you see there's a slightly longer gap between those two. And then we have to swing across here. And jump. There we go. Second gem. Then we have to get all the way back down again. Which is fun. So again. Time it, Cal. No. Well, you do at least restart the jewel if you, uh, if you die when you've picked it up. Which is something. Oh no. Dead. <sighs> yes, this is... Um, <clears throat> this is one of those games where... Falling too far will kill you. And so you need to kind of get your head around that as well as everything else it's doing. So, let's have another go. Oh, 
I liked this game when I first discovered it because it, it was something a bit different, which is something that Synapse Software was pretty well known for. Um, they were known for doing things that were a little bit unconventional and quite innovative and revolutionary in some ways. Um, one of the earlier games was um, one of the earliest split-screen games out there. It was a game called Nautilus. Uh, and it was an asymmetric game as well. So one player was controlling a ship on the surface of the ocean, and the other one was controlling a submarine. Um, they also later did a game called Shadow World that was uh, a bit more symmetrical in terms of what both players did. It was sort of vaguely cooperative. Um, you had to fly around uh, a sort of 2D open world landscape trying to destroy these pods that were falling down from the sky. That was a game I enjoyed very much back in the day. And it was cool to have the option to play it split screen. Nautilus was always split screen, but Shadow World would actually play full screen if you were playing by yourself and going to split screen if you were playing two player. That was something I always thought was pretty cool. I often didn't have someone to play with, of course, but uh, <laughs> because I, I found the, the split screen effect quite... Oh, no. Because I found the split screen effect quite pleasing, I uh, would often actually deliberately start a two-player game just so that I could I could see the the split screen effect. I don't know. I was a weird kid. We've established this already. If you've watched the Atari A to Z series, you will know that I particularly like platform games that they have hills in. So, you know, I guess playing a split screen game with yourself is no more weird than that. Right, let's get this right this time. That's not going to get right. Let's go. Oh no! Oh. Well, hopefully you're getting the idea of how this game works anyway. It does um, sort of advance in difficulty a bit further as you go through and you start getting more enemy types to deal with along the way as well. You might have noticed those on the title screen. Um, and you have to deal with them in various different ways as you progress through the game. But this is one of many games from the period where it's quite an achievement to even get through the first level. So I can't believe I fell off there. You know what? I'm going to see if we can go this way. That's just falling off. There we go. Nice shortcut up here. And this idea of having sort of <laughs> that idea of having uh, multiple routes that you could take through the game as well was uh, was quite an interesting one in this one. So anyway, that's Quasimodo. I won't drive you mad with my platforming incompetence any further, but hopefully you've had a good idea of uh, of what that game is all about by this point. So check that out. That's Quasimodo for the Atari 8-bit. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you again next time. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please help out the channel by leaving a like or a comment and subscribing. New episodes of Atari A to Z are on Tuesdays and Atari ST A to Z on Thursdays. Check out Atari A to Z .wordpress.com for a full archive. Do please also check out my other projects, MoeGamer.net, where I explore Japanese and Japanese inspired games from yesterday and today, and VideoPackGames.wordpress.com, which aims to catalogue the small but well formed library of the Philips G7000 Video Pack Computer, also known as the Magnavox Odyssey 2. You can also support my work on Patreon or buy me a coffee. You can find links to do both down in the video description. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.